system development. System development can be defined as a process of developing a new system, software or program, or the process of upgrading or amending an existing one for better performance. So when we are talking about system development, assuming there is no system in place, let us assume that there is a company that has been using manual method in order to process their data, they might want to develop a new system for better performance. So, or let us assume that there is a system in place, but we just need to upgrade the system. So it's also part of a system development. That's why I always say that system development is a process of developing a new system, software, or program, or the process of upgrading an existing one. There are so many reasons why we might need to, to develop a new system, maybe for better performance, Maybe for I mean to increase productivity, to increase productivity or to increase output. Then better customer service. Then to promote corporate image. To promote corporate image. Then, to comply with rules and regulations, with rules and regulations. Then, we also develop new system in order to reduce the rate of error, that is error reduction. And also, to increase quality of output to increase or to improve quality of product and services. So these are some of the reasons whereby we can uh, we need to develop a new system. Now there are so many approaches to system development. As we want to develop a new system, what are the available approaches? Huh, one, we have traditional system development life cycle traditional system development life cycle the number two we have prototyping we have outsourcing Then we have end user computing. End user computing. Then we have what's called judge. Judge means joint application development. Joint application development. Then we also have Raj. That is rapid application development. So these are some of the approaches that can be used in order to develop, in order to develop a new system. Factors to be considered in the development or design of a new system. That is, if we want to design a new system or we want to develop a new system, what are those factors we need to consider? The first one is the purpose or objectives of the company or of the organization. Simply because before an organization will say they want to develop a new system or they want to upgrade a new, they want to upgrade an existing one, there must be reasons for it. So we have to consider the objective of the uh, of the organization. Then the cost effectiveness. That is, the Money we are going to spend on the development of a new system or upgrading a new system must not outweigh the benefit, and that is what we call cost effective effectiveness. So in, in that case, we have to perform what we call cost benefit analysis. We have to perform what we call cost benefit analysis. So from there, we'll be able to know whether the system we want to develop cost effective or not. 
Then the next one is re reliability in terms of hardware and in terms of software. Then we also have workflow. When we talk of this workflow, it means that the system must meet the, the best workflow with the system must meet the best workflow in terms of metals in terms of metals of data transmission that is the new system we want to develop or the existing system we want to upgrade must be able to meet the best workflow in terms of the method of transmitting data then the next one is data representation when you say data representation it means that the data must be presented to the computer that is data must be presented to the computer in machine readable form in machine readable form so that is when the, the system can actually accept the data and it can work on it so we also have what we call technical support that is by the time we put the system into operation so we have to think of the technical support because they are, by the time we develop the system and we are using it, we will have to carry out maintenance. And uh, it, by the time you want to, to be carried, you want to be carry out maintenance of the system, do we actually have the technical expert within the company that can handle it, or we need to, or we need to outsource, or even by the time we even want to develop the system, do we have the technical expert? within an organization that can handle it, if not, this is the company cannot decide to outsource, uh, to, to outsource. And when we say outsourcing, it simply means subcontracting part of the business activities of, of an organization to outsiders, which we are still going to discuss compressively during the course of this lecture. So the next one is time requirement. We have to look at the time it will take an organization to actually develop a new system. So, and that is why, by the time I want to develop a new system, there's something called feasibility study, which we are still going to discuss. But among this, uh, this when we talk of this feasibility, one of the types of feasibility is what we call schedule, schedule feasibility. That is, by the time we carry out this type of feasibility, we'll be able to know the time it will take an organization to develop a system, the time they will start, and the time they will finish the development of a system. So it doesn't mean that by the time we are developing the system, we just start and we will not, we, we, we will not have the time we, we, uh, we are going to end or we are going to finish the development. We must have what we call time schedule, the time we are going to start, and at the same time, the time we are going to finish. Then the next one is methods of financing a new system. If you want to finance a new system, what are the available, uh, uh, what are the methods of financing a new system? For example, we can use what you call outright purchase. It's just like now. We, we have a fully developed system. We just go to the developer, we pay for it outrightly, and we are using it. Or, if we contract the development of the new system to a consultant or a vendor, the, any amount that it will cost, the company pay it outrightly and after the development, they collect it and they take the ownership of the system and they are using it. Then the second thing is that we may use what you call leasing. That's the leasing of the computer system. It is just a situation whereby the company will, will enter into contract with another company that will supply the, the, the system and uh, they have to they can use it for some number of years maybe five years maybe 10 years maybe 15 or 20 years so after that uh, the expiration of the agreed time the time it, uh, the contract can now be renewed then at the same time we can use uh, renters when we talk of these renters the their payment agreement may be on monthly basis or on yearly basis benefits of installing a new system that is, what are the benefits uh, companies tend to derive from installing or developing a new system? One, we have increased efficiency or effectiveness. Increased efficiency and effectiveness.
then cost saving better customer service then timely and accurate information then there will be more revenue from sales There will be more revenue from sales. There will be better cost, to, better stock control, better stock control, and staff motivation. Staff motivation. So. Which means that by the time an organization develop or install a new system, there will be increased efficiency and effectiveness, there will be cost saving. For example, when we look at the cost saving, we have in a situation whereby the company, let's assume a company has, uh, that was using a manual method before, definitely more hands or more staff will be needed. But by the time they now develop a new system, to definitely reduce the number of staff they will have. In that case, to the management, to definitely uh, reduce the uh, cost. Then better customer service, then timely and accurate information. It will be very easy to generate information. For example, through the use of computer, it will be fast and easy. And at the same time, accurate information can easily be uh, can be generated because computer produce accurate results. Then there will be more re more revenue from sales. Better co um, stock control. It will be very easy to control stock, and there will be what to call staff motivation. And we will now look at this. Apart from this uh, uh, benefit, there are some. Uh, uh, there are some disadvantages too. For example, if we look at the disadvantages, we have uh, there will be what we call staff turn. There may be what we call staff turnover, because by the time you want to develop a new system, the staff may not look at look at the advantages. They will be looking at it in such a way that maybe it will affect their work. Because definitely, when a new system is developed, it will definitely reduce the number of staff, and uh, there will be what we call uh, job insecurity. So in that case, once there is job insecurity, yeah, there will be what we call staff. The stock, I mean, staff turnover. Then the next one is that if the system is down, if the system breaks down, that is breaking down of a system, breaking down of a system will, def will uh, affect the activity of the company, will affect the activities of the company. That's why sometimes you go to you go to some organizations, if they have uh, some technical problem, they will just say, please, our system is down. So if their system is down, it means there's nothing they can do again. Then the, another thing now is that we have uh, the cost of acquisition and maintenance. High cost of acquisition and maintenance. High cost of acquisition. Acquisition and maintenance. Because they have to, we have to acquire the hardware, they have to acquire the software and some other things. Then they look at the, the and also the cost of uh, maintaining the new system. Then the next one is cost of installing a new system. What are, if we want to, to install or develop a new system? What are the costs that we are going to incur? One, cost of hardware. Cost of hardware. Cost of hardware and software. Then number two, installation cost. Installation cost. Then we have site preparation cost. Site preparation cost. It's just like when you want to when you want to install a computer room. I mean, you want to install some computers. It means you need a special room called computer room. In order to install the computers and the computer room is always a special room where computers and its accessories are installed so there are some facilities or equipment that must be there in that case we have to prepare the room very well and that is what we call site preparation it means we are going to spend some money in order to make sure that the available i mean the necessary facilities uh, are put in place then the next one is training cost cost of training 
when you acquire a new system or you develop a new system, the staff that will be operating the system need to be trained. They will also have conversion cost. That is the cost of converting old file, especially let's say manual file to electronics. Then also we have what you call maintenance cost. Maintenance cost. Then we have personnel cost. Then we have operating cost. And most importantly, we have what you call redundancy cost. When you talk about redundancy cost, this is the money that will be paid as entitlement to those staff that the new system will affect their work. Definitely by the time we want to develop a new system, some staff may need to be sacked. Some, some staff may need to be laid off. So those people that, that the new system will affect their work, it doesn't mean that they are not ready to work. It doesn't mean that they are not, uh, they are not qualified to work or, uh, or the, the energy loss is not there to work, but the new system cannot accommodate them. Because the new system now render them redundant, so it means they need to be paid. So the money that will be paid to those staff that they, they, the new system will affect their work, so it's what you call redundancy, because everything will be added together as you form part of the cost of uh, developing a new system. System development life cycle. System development life cycle is a term used in systems engineering, information systems, and software engineering to describe a process of planning, creating, testing, and deploying an information system. So it provides a sequence of activities. It provides a sequence of activities for system designers for system designers or developers system designers and developers To follow, that it, it provides a sequence of activity for system, system developers and designers to follow. So in that case, it consists of a set of steps of all stages. It consists of a set of steps, stages, stages. or phases. Now, in which each phase of the system development life cycle, in which each stage of the system development life cycle uses the results of the previous ones, uses the results of the previous ones. So what you are saying now is this, if you want to develop a new system, there are some stages that you will need to be followed. So in that case, one stage after the other, and the results of one stage will now be used by the, uh, the, the second stage. So which in that a parallel stage will use the result of the previous stage. Now system development phases or stages. In system development stage, I mean, uh, stages or phases, we have what you call planning. And this planning can as well be called initiation stage. The planning, this defines or clarifies the problems. The need for an IT system is expressed and the purpose and the scope of the IT system is documented. The, what we are just saying now is this. During the planning stage, this is where uh, the, the, the problem will be defined or what we want to call problem definition. The reason is that for us to, to decide, for an organization to decide that they want to develop a new system, it means there must be some problem with this, excuse me, with the system they are using presently. 
So during planning stage, you have to look at the present system they are using and look at the problems that system that system will have in order to actually know how the appropriate system they are going to develop in order to solve that particular problem. So and at the, at the, at the same time. After the uh, problem definition, you, during this planning stage, they will be able to decide on the scope. That is the area the new system will actually will cover. So a steering committee is set up by the management in order to ensure the interest of all stakeholders are taken, in order to ensure that the interests of all stakeholders are taken care of. And the aspects of this stage may be referred to as the statement of uh, scope and objectives we are still going to look at CRE committee in detail because normally CRE committee in the exam if they want to test it they only they always test the members of steering committee which you are still going to look at members of steer of CRE committee then functions functions of steering committee so these are those some of the uh, area or uh, these are the two ways whereby they normally test the steering committee which you are still going to look at in detail during the course of this lecture then after the planning or initiation stage the second stage is what you call feasibility study stage a feasibility study is carried out on a, is carried out in order to ascertain problems of the present system expectations and requirements of end users of the system in order to determine immediate and future operational requirements of the organization. So when we are talking about feasibility study stage, at this stage, this is where feasibility study will be carried out. And in other words, feasibility study can be defined as the study, the study carried out on an existing system. on an existing system and the reasons and the reasons why and the reasons why the existing system so should be should be changed to new system and most importantly by considering the cost and benefits by considering the cost and benefits of the new system the cost and benefits of the new or proposed system so the major objectives of this stage is to conduct a preliminary analysis, propose alternative solutions, describe cost and benefits, and that is what we call cost benefit analysis, and submit a preliminary plan with recommendations. And also in this stage, one need to find out the organization's objective and the nature and scope of the problem under study. You have to know the objective of the organization. From there, we'll be able to know how to prefer. Uh, appropriate, appropriate uh, solution to the problem, and this one can only be done through feasibility studies. Then the next stage is system acquisition or, de uh, or development stage. Acquisition of hardware and software requirements describes desired features and operations in detail, including screen layouts, business rules, process diagrams, single code, and other documentation. Then we still have to translate design specifications into code, build the technical architecture, build the programs and database, and carry out necessary tests. And in purchasing, in, in purchasing a, a request for proposal is sent to uh, selected vendors, their proposals received and evaluated. Demonstration and presentation of the different applications are shown to, uh, to selected and experienced uh, staff. What you are saying here is this. The system acquisition or development stage. This is where we are going to acquire the hardware. We are going to acquire the hardware, the software. That is the hardware that will be required. Hardware that will be required. Sorry, the software that will be required, 
and also what will be the features or characteristics of the proposed system. We have to look at it. The screen, the screen layout, the, the business rules, the process diagrams, single code, and other documentation. And when we say documentation, documentation simply means the process of establishing a permanent record of a computer file or of a program. Then after that, there's something called specification. The specification needs to be translated into code in order to build the technical architecture. And normally when we say uh, system specification, it is a document. It is a document prepared by the system analyst. It is a document prepared by the system analyst. That that will show the requirement of the proposed system. That show the requirement of the proposed system. In terms of input, process, storage. Output and data transmission. So the document that we saw, the requirements of the new system in terms of input, in terms of storage, in terms of output, in terms of process, in terms of data transmission. That particular document is what you call uh, is what you call a system specification, which we are still going to look at in detail. Now, by the time we now look at this, we are still going to build what we call database. And when we say database, database can be uh, defined as uh, a, set, uh, a set of related files or data, where structured, arranged, and stored in a central system that can be accessed by authorized users. Now, after after this, we now try to we now send out what we call request for proposal to selected vendors. And this one can only happen if the company decide to outsource the development of the new system or of the proposed system. They have to send out a request for proposal to uh, vendors or consultants in order to submit their proposals. Then their proposal will be received and evaluated. Then something like demonstration will be done with, or will be carried out by experienced staff in order to be able to pick, to pick uh, an appropriate uh, uh, proposal. So before the, the development will take place. But if this, this is, if the company decide to use in-house staff, that is, decide to use their staff, if they have the technical expert among their staff, if there are, if there are staff that are, and that have that skill in order to, de to develop the system, they can still make use of it. But if there, if there's no, uh, uh, if among their staff, they can't find any uh, staff that has that skill to develop the software or to develop the system, it means they need to outsource. How they need to do that? It means they are going to send out request for proposal to so many vendors, re re receive their request, or, re or re receive their, their proposal, access their proposal, check their de demonstrations, presentation, and everything before the, before the final selection will be made. Number four, system installation and training. Here, the system is installed with an appropriate hardware and associated ancillary equipment like servers, printers, and so on, and a telecommunication network set up for enterprise usage and access to information. So what you are saying now is that after developing the system, we have to install the system, the hardware, and all other necessary equipment. That is all, all unnecessary devices, or even including peripheral devices everything will be will be uh will be installed and also a telecommunication network will be set up in order to allow the people or the staff to be able to have access to the information then it also ensures that proper training on the system is on the system is carried out documented before transitional uh, before transition or before i uh, operated the system and also uh, uh, it supports staff and end users. So training has to be carried out. And normally when we say training, it starts to do with the process of acquiring knowledge about the operation of a particular system. And training can be acquired through workshops and, semi and seminars, 
workshops or seminar then it can as well be acquired through online training the star can be trained online then through a uh, documentation that is the, 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 the document or the training manual, the manual that comes with the system to documentation or manual then through the use of IT journals or textbooks so these are some of the ways whereby training can be uh, can be acquired maybe through workshops it may be through online training maybe through uh, uh, documents or training manual or system manual maybe through it journals then we can also acquire training through formal training when you say formal training that is just like somebody attending a, a, tra a computer training institute in order to acquire knowledge on how to uh, actually operate a particular system then the next stage is system operation or life operation that is after the system has been installed after the users has been after the users have been trained then there will be what you call life operation the life operations of the system will be done here and necessary adjustment will be made the application will be implemented and this is done in a phased approach starting with uh, with one unit of an organization and uh, proceeding to the rest this approach provides opportunity to correct anomalies before enterprise-wide implementation we have to we have to make sure we operate the the system it's just like when we are trying to carry out tests then we we'll have to we have to make sure we operate the system we can choose a particular segment in a, or a particular unit in an organization in order to test the system so in order to test run the system during this uh, life operation we'll be able to discover any problems and we'll be able to correct uh, uh, to to make necessary amendment before the system will now be uh, will be implemented in the whole organization then the next one is system maintenance after the system has been properly te tested then it means we are we have uh, uh the, the organization can now decide to start using the system and during this i mean during system uh, uh usage or operation there will be need for maintenance and in that case when we say maintenance maintenance has to do in the exam many of maintenance can be tested types of maintenance can be tested which you are still going to look at during the course of this lecture and also reasons for maintenance can also be tested which you are still going to look at but normally maintenance has to do with taking care taking care of a system in order to ensure that the system the system is in good working condition the system is in good working condition so it means we have to carry out that maintenance and uh, normally we have to uh, we, uh, the, uh, we have so many reasons why we need to, to carry out maintenance to, to prolong the lifespan of the of the system then to increase the speed of operation then to increase output to increase output then for efficiency and effectiveness for efficiency and uh, effectiveness so these are some of the then also to reduce the rate of error to reduce the rate of error these are some of the ways whereby you need to maintain our systems and uh, we also have types of maintainer which we are still going to look at uh, during the course of this lecture and they are co I mean, preventive maintenance corrective maintenance adaptive maintenance and preventive and, uh, uh, pa and uh, uh, perfective maintenance although we are going to look at them uh, one after the other then the last stage is post implementation review this is where the system that was developed 
as well as the entire process is reviewed. This is usually carried out by the auditors. The main focus is to confirm that the expected project objectives and benefits have been achieved, determine adequacy of the system design with installed features and capabilities. Then the auditors also confirm whether the project was executed online, I mean on time, that is on time, within budget and adequate control have been put in the system for overall efficiency. So we have to make sure we carry out what you call post-implementation review. And this is where we are going to get uh, what you call feedback. This is where we are going to get feedback. And when we talk of this feedback, we have what you call positive positive feedback and uh, negative negative feedback. So if it is positive feedback, it is a positive feedback, we definitely uh, well, it will require improvement in the same direction of the achievement while negative feedback will require adjustment in the opposite direction of the of the achievement and normally the post implementation review is always carried out by the auditor simply because the auditor will be able to look at so many things whether the expected features or characteristics have been included in, the, in this new system and at the same time in terms of cost whether the the, the system that is the new system that was developed was financed within the 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 agreed or approved budget or not and whether the accurate may appropriate control has been put in place then after that we we'll now try to look at what to call steering committee as i said the other time when an organization wants to develop a new system steering committee will be the first committee to be set up by the management and uh, as i said earlier on we are going to look at what you call the members of steering committee members of steering committee and uh, functions functions of uh, steering committee